So that is a difficult setup. I'm not magical in any way. Uh, I am probably the luckiest man you have ever met. Uh, and actually, that's probably the, the story of my life, if you want. I, um, I, uh, I, maybe a quick introduction. I run the business side of Google X, or now X, uh, which uh, in, in brief words, it's basically walking around the corridors, working with the most brilliant human beings that ever existed, who are passionately working on the most exciting projects that, uh, you know, that are important for mankind. We call them moonshots. And uh, my job is to pretend that I'm as smart as they are, so that they let me in, and then pretend that I, it's very hard to uh, sell the products they're making, while actually it's, it's quite simple. I mean, think about that. We make uh, self-driving cars, Google Glass, um, you know, Project Loon, I'm sure you heard of Project Loon. Uh, we make, um, uh, you know, um, uh, innovations in the energy space, in the medical space, uh, things that truly, truly change the world. So when you think about it, uh, it's not very hard to convince a client to try what is going to be the next uh, revolution. And my job is to pretend that this is hard and as, we, uh, as we create uh, those businesses with clients. Um, but the concept of moonshots is truly something that I, uh, I take to heart. I think it's, uh, it's something that is a slightly different way of, uh, of the way we do things. Uh, normally, um, you, you know, Silicon Valley's approach or any innovation approach is to find a product or something, you know, like the next uh, photo sharing app that is so much better than the existing photo sharing app. And, and, you know, do it so well that you become very rich. And that's good. Uh, X, decide, you know, uh, thinks differently. We, we look for the worst problems out there, the biggest problems that face mankind. And we try to uh, find um, what we call uh, radical solutions to them, something that is so different about the way you solve it, uh, that, it, becomes, um, that, it that it becomes almost science fiction to solve it, if you want. Uh, but, but the idea is that the biggest problems in the world cannot be, imp cannot be solved by, uh, by, by doing what you've always done slightly better. That you cannot change the world that way. You can only change the world if you decide, okay, let me take a, a, clear sheet, a clean sheet of paper and start over, start solving the problem over. And, and to, to myself, which I consider a core Googler and most of the Google culture or alphabet culture, if you want uh, now, uh, is really centered around that. It's really, really centered around making a big difference to the world, making a huge difference to the lives of people in billions. And when you do that, it's okay to make money, okay? Which is very, very different than the approach that capitalism normally uh, takes to, to making money. And so to me, when I tell you I'm the luckiest person on earth, it's because I truly would pay to do this, okay? I, I mean it, and I say it publicly in front of my managers all the time. I would pay money to be in that place and to be able to, uh, to, to live a life where you wake up every morning and you really are living your purpose. I think you're going to be talking about this a lot in the next few days. Uh, is, is truly uh, what I, defi I define as the luckiest person in the world. To be paid for it, well, that's even better, right? Uh, I have uh, surprisingly always been uh, lucky. Uh, I, uh, I am an Egyptian, so I was educated in Ain Shams University, uh, which you cannot even pronounce, but if you do, you can realize that compared to, uh, uh, to Stanford, I have not been educated. Okay? Uh, so to be where I am now... Uh, What's the same Shams University? I have no idea. It's like uh, the eye of the sun. Yeah, the eye of the sun. <laughs> uh, but to... to, uh, to uh, to be where I am now was a series of fortunate events, if you want. So I, uh, I had a car accident with a friend uh, at a point in time that uh, got me to work at IBM, uh, which was um, um, uh, an amazing school. At the time, IBM was truly changing the world. I am an old man, notice. And, uh, you know, and then I had a moral disagreement with uh, an employer uh, that I can share with you later that got me to leave and join Microsoft at the time that Microsoft was changing the world. Uh, and then I joined Google, believe it or not, uh, because I, just, I had just promoted one of my uh, team members to a job that he really wanted, and then the headhunter called him in my presence. 
And so he said, oh, I'm happy with my job, but you should talk to Mo. It's as simple as that, right? Uh, and, uh, and, um, yeah, and, and when you think about that, I was also very lucky. As at, a, at a very young age, I was very successful. I was a director before age 30. I was a day trader, so I was making piles of money because of my, my math skills. And, uh, and it just rolled that way throughout my life. When you think about it, uh, you would uh, definitely agree that, uh, that uh, I should be happy. Uh, but that wasn't always the case. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, with all the success, all the money, all the world travel, I travel the world all the time, there are very few cities that I have not been to, all the career, all the cars and toys and things, and uh, most importantly, uh, with those uh, two individuals, I had, uh, I, I married my college sweetheart, a wonderful woman called Nibel, and uh, we had Ali and Aya, my daughter and my, uh, my, my son and my daughter, uh, very, very quickly. I mean, like, uh, I, was age, I was 26 when I had both of them. And, um, and Ali and Aya were truly incredible kids. I mean, truly, I mean, every parent says that, but Aya was truly a sunshine. But both are very wise people, surprisingly, and, uh, and both were, you know, complemented a part of our life that was really incredible. Aya was truly our sunshine. She, she would light every room she comes into. She was, you know, she, she's, she, she's, um, energetic, passionate, fun, you know, when we go anywhere, she'd, she'd be leading us to, to the best places. Ali, on the other hand, was peaceful, quiet, zen in a very interesting way. And as I had those two wonderful kids and a wonderful family, I was severely unhappy. Uh, as, I, as I made sometimes up to 12% a month on my day trades, uh, I was more and more unhappy. As I bought cars and toys and big houses, I was more and more unhappy. I think by 2001, uh, I almost uh, uh, would, would, would have been uh, clinically uh, diagnosed depressed, right? Uh, the more my, uh, my, my living standards and you know, the things that I had in life uh, uh, evolved, the more uh, depressed I became, okay? Which I actually say is a story that is very familiar in my circles. You'd be surprised how many of the rich and famous are very unhappy, okay? Uh, and um, and um, as I, uh, I, you know, as in my part of the world, unlike here, you don't go to a clinic and take that matter into someone, some expert's hands. We don't accept that very well. Uh, it's like macho to be a man and okay and so on. And so I took matters into my own hands. And in, to in 2001, I started to do what I always did reasonably well, which is I bought a pile of books. I actually bought every piece of knowledge I could find on the, uh, on, uh, on the, on the topic. I, l I heard every lecture. I attended every seminar. I made happiness my purpose. Okay? Uh, I, I researched everything you can think of. I'm, I'm not a psychologist or a, you know, a, a, an economist or a professor uh, you know, or, or that has the resources to do research, but I just tried to get my hands on everything I could get. Uh, which I think everyone can do. I think what I, st what I tried to do slightly differently is I applied my engineering skills to the problem. So most of the literature you have around happiness is either anchored in spirituality and practices and meditation and so on and so forth, or it's anchored in statistics and, you know, 50% of people do, who do this do that and so on. I, I have a bit of a weird way of looking at things. I literally had addressed the problem as an engineer. I took the machine, I said there is something wrong with this machine, and I broke it apart. I took every part of the problem out, and I started to analyze with very simple experiments. You'll be, I hope you will like some of them. Uh, why is it that we, are, that we end up so unhappy when everything is supposed to make us happy? Okay? I, I broke the machine apart, and I looked for clues along the way. And then, at a point in time, I think around 2007, 2008, I started, it started to click. You, I started to find things that, uh, that basically made it make sense. It, it, the, the sort of what was wrong with the machine, if you want. And then I put it back together in a model that myself and my family lived for a long time. Maybe we didn't have it clear as a model, but there were simple concepts that were uh, that were very prominent in our life, and accordingly, I was, by 2009, 2010, I was always happy. 
uh, like literally, you put me, I mean, I'm a Middle Eastern, right? So I land in JFK and it's gonna be an hour and a half before I get out, right? <laughs> And it's, you know, homeland security every time. They'll say, hey, Mo, come back, you know, answer the same questions you answered last time, right? And, and so, but, but nothing would dent my happiness. I would just simply go through those things with no problem whatsoever, okay? Uh, and, uh, and, so, and, and Ali, at the time, also became such a beacon, if you want, um, uh, that he, he started to really, really have, you know, how teenage can be, huh? He was super cool, super calm all the time. It started to be very apparent that the, the few beliefs that we switched in our minds uh, were working. And so what, uh, what I did then is I started to build that model in a way that eventually became my personal moonshot. So while, while at work I wake up in the morning and I try to build moonshots that save, you know, that, that, that serve the li or change the lives of billions of people, uh, uh, my personal moonshot was uh, to make happiness, which I have to say is a huge problem uh, uh, in our modern world today, uh, to, to, have, uh, to change the, 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 the concept of how we see and how we understand happiness. And this became a book for an interesting reason. Many, many of you may know that. Uh, so, so let me tell you about Ali and how Ali impacted uh, our life. Ali, um, I think in, in three words you could say he was probably uh, the most peaceful, kindest, and wisest man I have ever met. And I, I know that sounds weird because he's my son, uh, but I had him at a very young age, and so uh, and I'm a bit kiddish myself. So we played music together, we, you know, we read books and discussed them together, we played video games endlessly together. Uh, and you know, he was very close, he was my, my, my best friend, and Ali was uh, very peaceful all the time. He was always Zen. Nothing would, would change his mood. And so he calmed me down even at the points where I was uh, and not, not a very happy person. Uh, but he was also a very kind person. He was the kind of person that would give himself totally uh, to others. So, so we, you know, we have uh, seasons of the year where we give our children big gifts, you know, uh, like idea we call them. And Ali would never buy a video game unless he buys his friend the same video game. His friend was not very, um, you know, um, capable of buying everyone. Uh, he wouldn't, you know, he would, when, he, when I decided to buy him a car, being a spoiling father than I, that, that I am, I said, hey, Ali, anything you want, a convertible Porsche if you want. And Ali decides, of course, not to do that, right? He decides to buy a car that is for his band where he can have you know, uh, their amps and guitars and what have you, and drives everyone around all the time. I think the one event that completely uh, um, um, I, I will always remember is uh, we were in Boston, and Ali, uh, he studied in Boston in, in, in Northeastern University, and Ali would walk to an old, uh, uh, an old homeless lady and sit next to her, literally at least 40 minutes. I, I didn't count exactly, but he sat next to her chatting for such a long time. And, you know, it, he, it wasn't like he gave her a dollar and went away. He was actually making her feel recognized, me, making, her, making her feel human. And then he basically emptied his pockets, gave her everything he, uh, he had, which I think is you know, not the biggest thing, but is very kind for a young man who has an allowance, and, and walked away. And so I saw her chasing him, r digging deep into her sack and getting out a... a a box of hand cream, uh, unopened, which in, in my view was probably her biggest treasure. Like this is the one thing that she said, you know, uh, when, when it's a great day, I'll open this thing, right? And gave that to him, and that became his biggest treasure until it's, it's now our biggest treasure. Some, you, some of you know, uh, uh, so, so the other thing, sorry, about Ali is that he was so wise that by age 18, I started to go to him for everything. Like literally, I'm not making this up. I, if I'm stuck in something at work or in life, I would go to Ali and say, Ali, what do you think of this? And in his very interesting way, he would just ask, ask a few questions and then uh, you know, smile and then sit quietly and then say one sentence, like literally one sentence, and I would go like, yeah, that sounds right, okay? He was so wise that at age 18, I publicly said to a lot of my friends, when I grow up, I want to be like Ali. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm not making this up. Uh, Ali, uh, unfortunately, uh, he, so he, he uh, li lived in uh, Boston. He, he called us in May 
of 2014, was it? Yeah. And, uh, and he basically uh, said, guys, I, you know, I know I wasn't planning to be here for summer, but uh, I really feel very compelled to come and see you. Took a flight, came over four days later. He was diagnosed with an appendicitis. Is that the right English word? And so, uh, and so we took him to a hospital. This is basically the simplest operation on the face of the planet, right? It's like cutting your nails, but you know, it's like a nail inside, sort of. So, so they put an endoscopy in, and they cut it, and they take it out, and that's it. When they put the endoscopy, they push, put a little bit of CO2 first to, to make space for the operation. And uh, the surgeon uh, punctured his main uh, blood vessel and put the CO2, exploded his blood vessel. And then in a series of like five more mistakes, uh, it took them like 25 minutes of chatting before they decided to put the, the thing in. So then, by then, he was already bleeding so much that blood really exploded out of, his, uh, out of the endoscopy. And then they called the cardiovascular ver uh, surgeon who wasn't there. Uh, and so by the time he arrived, uh, it was really, really critical. And they clipped his artery, but he, they clipped it wrong. So uh, around two hours later, he was still bleeding. And we lost him, I believe, around five hours into the operation. They told us around 16 hours later. But anyway, uh, in, you know, in, a, in, an, in, a, in five hours from the moment where you have your best friends with you coming to visit, uh, you know, Aya was with us as well, so it was a wonderful uh, week and, uh, to, to the point where you lost your son. And so um, one thing uh, about, about that exp experience was that Unlike most parents, uh, we simply walked in, we simply smiled, kissed him on the forehead. My um, uh, Nibel, his mother at the time, uh, just literally said the most incredible thing I've ever heard. She said, uh, Habibi, my loved one in Arabic, Habibi, you're finally home, okay? Uh, and so, um, in, uh, you know, in, in, in that experience, we were not angry. We were, we were not disgruntled with life. We were not... I wouldn't say we were happy, of course it would be a, a crazy thing to say that we were happy, but we were not unhappy, which was really, really an interesting observation for us. Uh, when, we, when, when, when we had the memorial, people would actually come to our house. We live in Dubai, so uh, in our, you know, we, had, we have this big house that fit like maybe hundreds of people, and yet more people would wait outside to come uh, in the heat of Dubai, probably 120 in summer. Uh, and everyone would come in crying. Uh, we would hug them. We would tell them what we think about what happened, and they would ease out, ease up, right? They would smile and they would take it easy. And then uh, they uh, they would uh, uh, literally, it, if you looked at the event, it looked like a gathering of friends. Everyone was laughing. Everyone was hugging. Everyone was looking at his pictures on the wall and remembering memories. It was really a very weird vibe. It was almost like a happy party. Okay, uh, a few days before Ali died, he uh, he sort of knew. I, I can tell you many stories about that. But he sat us down a few days before he died, and he told each one of us uh, what um, what he loved about us, almost like a grandfather, you know, giving his will. Uh, he he started by saying, "Oh, I feel, uh, uh, you know, I know it's going to sound weird that uh, you know I'm giving advice to my parents and all in his own, in his own words." Uh, but, you know, I really feel compelled to tell you this, guys. And then he went to Aya, to Nibel, and to myself, gave us like a good 10 minutes of, this is what I love about you, this is what I'm grateful for, you know, you made that difference to me, I love that very much, but here are a couple of things I want you to do for me, okay? And from me, he said, I want you to rely on your heart a little more and uh, never stop working, okay? which I have to tell you was a big thought on my mind at the time. He said, you're making a big difference, you're going to make a bigger difference, never stop working. So after the memorial, a lot of people started to come to me and say, you really have to tell people how you did this. You really have to tell people how you're okay with losing your son and best friend. And so I started to, to write 17 days after Ali uh, left, and I could not stop. I'm not making this up. I could not stop. For four and a half months, I wrote nonstop, like eight to 12 hours a day. Uh, Michael Carlyle, my agent, is here. Uh, I met Michael in January, uh, just six months after, with 600 pages uh, of literature around happiness that ended up being uh, this. So uh, a, a book that is 
an engineering approach to happiness, if you want, uh, with, uh, an, with a, with a, with a um, um, an, an objective at the time of reaching, uh, you know, a million people maybe to become happy. Uh, the book is going to. Uh, the book is ready by May. Uh, we have one more edit, I hope to do, and uh, but we decided to launch after uh, after uh, presidential elections, so in January. But the way we looked at it is that this book is what we call rocket fuel at Google X. So this is something that will help us uh, get the message to people. But the real mission uh, is a mission that we call 10 million people happy. So, and that's for a salesman like me, this is sandbagging. Okay. Uh, we, you know, we, we, I hope to get a message to, uh, to 10 million people where 10 million people will, uh, you know, find something that makes them a little happier uh, and, uh, and basically uh, hopefully tell others uh, about, uh, about those things. And I'll tell you a little bit about the mission as we go on. But that's my mission, sort of, that's my fulfillment of my son's request. Uh, so, uh, before we start, uh, I, uh, I am not a guru, and I'm not a saint, uh, and I'm not a sage, and as a matter of fact, I'm not always happy, okay? So I'm not the kind of person that will come and talk to you about happiness because I'm, a, I'm the Dalai Lama, right? Uh, His Holiness is a very different person than I am. He, uh, he knows about this a lot better than I am. Uh, all I know is I found the model that works, okay? When you apply the model, it works, right? Uh, I'm like you, I, a street warrior. I listen to Pink Floyd, and I, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I, I fight in business meetings, and I negotiate deals. So I, I, my model, I hope you will find, is a lot more applicable to the real world. Okay? Uh, this stuff is hard. Okay? Uh, surprisingly, uh, happiness, even though we, you would expect that we would be here in a session where we would jump and dance, and that's a very easy way to become happy, uh, no, uh, it's actually quite deep and quite hard, and it's a lot of stuff that we're going to talk about today, and we will only probably cover 40% of what we need to talk about. Uh, so, uh, so, because what I will try to do is tell you the theory, not the practice. I won't tell you to meditate, I will tell you why meditation works, okay? Uh, and then you can apply it, uh, whether through meditation or through anything that you want. Uh, there will be no brand names, okay? So I'm not going to use the word meditation or, uh, what's the other one, mindfulness. I'm not even going to use the word God. These are tired brands. Institutions have taken those brands and uh, claimed ownership for them and basically uh, made them uh, not the core of what they are. So when, when we talk about things, please, uh, I may even ask you to, to, to change some of your lingo. We're going to try and call things what they really are. We're not going to call them the brand names that that are around them. Uh, what we will discuss is going to be some overlooked common sense. Some of the things we will talk about, you will go like, whoa, how did I miss that? That's so easy, right? Some of it will be uh, undisputed science. So sometimes we'll go into things like relativity and quantum physics and stuff like that. I hope you will be OK with that. I'll simplify as much as we can for everybody. And those who are experts in those topics, please don't go too deep in them. But some will be philosophical. Some, some will be the kind of stuff that you need to make your own mind up on, okay? And when we, get, when we hit the, those things, I will ask you for just this session to please not behave the way we learned to behave in the West, okay? Number one, uh, if you can prove nothing, some, if there is something you cannot prove either for or against, okay, please entertain it. Our approach normally is if I cannot prove it, it's not real, okay? No, our approach should be if I cannot prove it, it might not be real, but it also might be real, okay? So just entertain it. And by the way, if you decide to be against it fully, if you really, really hate it, that doesn't mean the rest of the conversation is bad, okay? So don't shut off. Don't say, okay, this point was wrong, then everything is wrong. All we're really looking for is just a few gold nuggets, okay? If you change five things today, you will be happier, okay? Uh, so don't stick to the ones that you don't agree with, Try to find the ones that you agree with. Oh, and by the way, you uh, are going to be doing most of the talking and working. So seriously, uh, you know, <clears throat> get your voices ready, and please participate as much as you can, if, if not for your own self, because your participation is going to help others uh, see the, pic the, the picture clearer. 
Now, do me a favor. Uh, if, we, if I manage to deliver something to you today that makes you happier, and I hope I will, okay? Uh, do me a favor and tell someone else about that. Okay? So remember, this is a mission. Hmm? So the mission, I, can, I cannot re reach 10 million people. The only way I can reach 10 million people is if you tell five people uh, about something you learned today and hopefully get them to, uh, to see something differently. At the same time, and please send a happy wish to my son. So I'm not shy to tell you that uh, the reason I want 10 million people to be happy is for 10 million people to send a happy wish to my son that he's happy wherever he is right now. Ready? Ready? Yeah. Okay. So.